Well, welcome again. Uh, thank you again for joining our sentiment-driven trading strategies powered by Adaptive AI webinar. My name is Eris Katz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Neurovest Research. Uh, I'd like to introduce some of my colleagues who have joined us today for this uh, webinar. Let me start with uh, recognizing um, from Dow Jones Newswires, our data provider partner, Martin Nelson, who is a director of product strategy for news analytics. On the NeuroVest side, I'm joined by Kayla Korf, who is our head of our r and uh, I'm also joined by Eric Davidson, who is our EVP of strategic accounts. And I actually have uh, two of our quants who worked on uh, the NLP part of the project and the portfolio construction with Dow Jones. Uh, Otar Sepper, PhD, who is a senior quant at Neurovest, and Brandon Bell, who is also a quantitative analyst. A little bit of logistics uh, before we get started. It's about a 45-minute webinar. We'll start with a 30-minute presentation, and we'll leave about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A at the end. Uh, before we also get started, I'd like to try and uh, jump quickly to the disclaimer and uh, basically um, get that out of the way. So just bear with us one second. I want to just quickly go to the uh, disclaimer slides and we can get started. So as you know, uh, we're going to be presenting some, uh, present some uh, results today that are mostly hypothetical and backwards looking. These are back test results that we're going to be sharing with you. Although we do try hard to include our fee structure and our uh, transaction costs and slippage, these are still uh, biased to uh, look ahead and uh, potentially uh, could be um, wrongly presented. So I want you to be aware of that. Uh, this um, We don't recommend any buying and selling of any stocks or any type of investment uh, um, itself. And um, we are a registered investment advisor and everything we're presenting here is for informational purposes only and not for any action, whether to buy or sell stocks. Uh, in the context of uh, backtest, as well as perpetual simulation of our uh, model portfolios, these are all again, hypothetical, driven by assumptions that could not be necessarily validated in the real, real world. So take those uh, as educational uh, and scientifically uh, presented uh, from, from scholastic perspective, but not from necessarily action in the market. Okay, let's get started. All right. <clears throat> so uh, a little bit about who we are. So uh, Neurovest develops and deploy adaptive strategies powered by machine learning and data science. Our offerings span across multiple asset classes and investment styles. We present uh, long only, short only, long short combination. And we go from intraday futures to multi-day low turnover equity-based portfolios. So we really are covering quite a bit of uh, research uh, outcome through our technology. Uh, the notion of our capabilities is what we call adaptive AI. What's adaptive AI is the ability for models to perpetually learn and self-adjust with fresh data and constant reassessment of their empirical performance. The whole idea is to allow our models to self-adjust and learn from the data that we garner as well as from the results of our strategies. Uh, one more slide about our technology and capabilities. So we have partnered with many data providers. You know, Dow Jones Newswire is a dear and large partner of ours, but the idea is to have data fuel our AI engine. And basically uh, we present our research outcome with our data providers as well as with their customers. And of course, present to our customer base a derived products, which are model portfolios that are derived from the data and the AI models that are empowering that data for analytics. Uh, we also uh, put our own money to work uh, with, our, with the same type of product that we sell to others and uh, validate it with our own empirical capital. So uh, that's kind of the business model of, of Norovest. I'll move on to uh, pass the mic to Eric Davidson, who will talk about our data and data relationships. Thanks, Aaron. So I, I run strategic data partnerships here for Norovest and a few points. Um, data plays a central role in our business. It is the fundamental building block of machine learning. And we believe good data is a significant differentiator in building active portfolios that can outperform passive benchmarks. 
We work with all different types of data, as this slide shows, from consumer transaction data to traditional fundamental data to ESG data. And the ethos of our firm is to work with not all data, but best of breed data. And when it comes to real-time news data, we wanted the most breadth and the most depth and the most feature-rich real-time data source for our strategies. Uh, and that is Dow Jones news Newswires. Um, next slide, please. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Martine Nelson at Dow Jones Newswires. Martine is the Director of Product Strategy for Dow Jones News Analytics, and I'll pass it over to Martine to say a few words. Thank you so much, Eric. We're really excited to uh, be working with Neurovest. We're always looking for innovative partnerships that can leverage our content um, and help clients. And we believe that our work together can extend the benefits of using alternative data to a broader set of clients by using Neurovest's expertise. Uh, as you know, hopefully Dow Jones has a long-standing history of providing premium real-time trusted news from Newswire to the financial community. Uh, that's including content from the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, and Market Watch. Um, our wires have global multi-asset coverage that combines exclusive market-moving stories, proprietary content, and relevant third-party content. And we've worked with Neurovest now, providing them a real-time news wires feed. And as with others in the investment community, uh, Neurovest has leveraged our taxonomy and historical archive to apply their expertise in AI and machine learning for the strategy that they'll be discussing today. We're really excited to share the results of this work with you and uh, explore additional strategies with Neurovest and Dow Jones data moving forward. And I will pass it back to Eric. Well, thank you so much, Martin. We're really excited about the relationship and what we had found so far using your data. And today we wanna to cover some of that. So in the context of uh, the battle between human and machines, free text analytics and uh, what we call uh, unstructured data tilts the advantage in the hands of the machine hands down. Why? Because no single human can cover and digest the ever-growing array of textual information flowing 24 by seven. So today uh, I'd like to demonstrate techniques which we thought were proven effective for portfolio construction based on automation of news sentiment. More specifically, we will demonstrate how we've taken Dow Jones Newswire's textual data and automated the ingestion, validation, and productionization of such data into a model portfolio offerings. A little bit more about our process. So everything starts from human intuition. So it's not pure machine doing everything. Uh, the initiation and the ideation comes from human and then we start the portfolio construction process. You can see that the first step is what really Eric is responsible for is to identify the data sets that are going to drive the narrative that has been uh, decided or declared by the expert or subject matter experts. Uh, and then of course, once data is identified, we validate it and we confirm that it actually provides some predictive power. And then the quant team takes over and create what we call features out of the data those features drive models. The models ultimately create uh, back tests that ultimately showing historically how the models perform over time. And once we feel that we are confirming, that we confirm the validity of these results, uh, such as uh, you know, lack of um, any biases or look ahead biases, selection biases and the likes, we actually uh, go to market. And when we go to market, uh, we go with a perpetual uh, paper trading first, and then we go with, uh, you know, a little bit of cash and then obviously grow the allocation based on the capacity as we, we allow to do so. Obviously, we work with a marketing team and, of course, with our partners to go to market and provide uh, a broader distribution of those products. So that's the process of how we go about building, in general, a model portfolio. So what is the hypothesis in the context of uh, Dow Jones Newswire. The basic premise is that if we analyze all the incoming articles published by a Dow Jones Newswire and attempt to score a sentiment or a value towards a subject matter, whether it's an asset, whether it's a sector, uh, a market or anything else, uh, we can identify somewhat normal distribution of sentiment scores across all the articles. If we had to score from negative 100, which is negative uh, 
sentiment all the way to positive 100, which is a positive sentiment, we will see a fairly nicely distributed uh, formation of, of the scores of the articles. Uh, our hypothesis is that the long tails of the distributions can provide opportunities for abnormal returns. So again, looking at those edges where the sentiments are extreme, they're not in the center, they're on the sides. And the basic premise is that uh, sentiment-driven alpha is that assets with high, highly polarized news articles, whether it's positive sentiment or negative sentiment, significantly outperform the benchmarks. Uh, and that's kind of the uh, idea behind our hypothesis. We were trying to prove that, of course, uh, with, with our scientific approach to investment and our, and our research. So we developed uh, multiple technologies, or we use multiple technologies that are what we call deep learning um, textual interpreters or uh, natural language processing interpreters. Um, the NLP technology used to be, um, in general, centered around um, a concept called uh, um, recurrent neural network. That's historically what was the, back then, a few years ago, state-of-the-art technology using LSTM technology. But um, the idea is that in the past few years, a new groundbreaking technology was introduced, uh, transformer architecture with a tension mechanism, Transformers are better in detecting contextual references between word in a sentence or in a paragraph. Transformers can be used effectively for language translation, but have become the state-of-the-art technology for content uh, sent sentiment. And uh, maybe in the context of uh, uh, describing more about uh, what is uh, BERT, what is the technology, and what else is out there, let me... Uh, allow Otar and uh, maybe Brandon to follow with their view of uh, the technology available today for NLP analysis. So Otar. Thanks, Erez. Um, yeah, so um, BERT is basically a modern state-of-the-art language and text processing uh, machine learning technique, right? And it's rooted in deep neural networks. It actually stands for bidirectional encoder representation. And the word bidirectional is important here because it signifies the advancement made by the self-attention mechanism, right? So it was developed at Google in 2018, and now it's actively used in a search engine for pretty much all in English query uh, searches. And it's also been adopted for over 70 languages by uh, Google. So the original BERT is actually pre-trained on Wikipedia using more than 3 billion words. And basically it currently constitutes one of the most popular modern uh, machine learning based NLP approaches uh, in research. So we know that in general, pre-training is expensive, but the advantage of BERT is that it can be fine tuned with less resources on smaller data sets to optimize its performance on specific tasks. In this particular case, right, we're trying to learn financial news sentiment. So the self-attention mechanism takes into account the context of each occurrence of a given word. So I'd like to give you an example. If we have an article that contains a sentence like cook apple pie versus an, another article that contains a sentence, Tim Cook apple stock, right? Words like cook and apple will have completely different representations in the self-attention mechanism. While in more traditional, simpler NLP models, they will have the same representation. Right? So that's the advantage. And in this particular case, we're using a very well adapted FinBird model that is domain specific. It's trained on very large scale financial corpus, right? Such as Yahoo Finance and, and actually more. And um, the results speak for themselves actually. So I, I'll pass it on to, to Brandon uh, to talk a little bit more about other general NLP models. But if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you, Otar. Uh, let's move on to Brandon uh, to discuss some of the other techniques we use for NLP analysis. 
Uh, thank you, Ares. <clears throat> so um, BERT is certainly one of the uh, more popular uh, and more widely used transformer architectures. Um, we're also investigating XLNet, uh, which shot up to fame a couple years ago um, for beating BERT in about 20 NLP tasks, uh, sometimes with quite substantial margins. Um, they're trained on a similar data set, that is Wikipedia, Reddit, um, the entirety of the internet. But the difference comes in their pre-training approach, um, where to put it simply, uh, XLNet has captures more richer context between words uh, than BERT does, which allows it to have um, a more dense semantic representation uh, of the context. And so we are uh, kind of investigating both of these approaches in parallel, um, fine tuning XLNet on our uh, financial data set um, and kind of seeing the pros and cons of each. Um, and it's a very exciting time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Otar. By the way, if anybody has any questions uh, to any of us during, uh, during the presentation or after, please post them on the Q&A icon on your webinar panel, and uh, we will be happy, happy to address them either in line, real time, or after the webinar is over. So thanks, uh, uh, gentlemen. I, I, I want to refer to uh, both Otar and Brandon as we talk about the implementation and also if we have time at the end, we'll talk about what's new, what else is happening in the NLP world and what other research they're currently working on uh, even before we have a product offering available to the market. So <clears throat> a little bit more about the Dow Jones news data set. So uh, the whole idea uh, is to identify um, a, a very well cataloged or categorized data set. You know, we call it tagging in, uh, in the NLP world, but essentially Dow Jones has done a fantastic job putting and catalog cataloging and categorizing content based on certain keywords, but also certain type of content. For example, analyst recommendations or analyst upgrades or downgrades are all categorized within a one set of tag uh, construct, right? And uh, uh, if it's gonna be any type of generic uh, general article, that's not necessarily a 10K or 10Q or any type of earnings release, uh, it will be tagged and categorized otherwise. So. We have a really nice way of uh, narrowing down the selection of what we are really looking for before we start to apply the, um, the sentiment analysis. Um, our, our goal initially was to search every day for all articles relevant to any given asset and aggregate them uh, and basically get an average score, average sentiment score for a given stock. How much, what's the score today for Apple compared to Apple's score you know, a few days in the, in the past? And what's the score of Apple today compared to Microsoft as an example. So these are the things we can do very easily to identify if there's any type of uh, information that's really relevant in the totality of the articles, not necessarily the type of article that's very, very specific. So uh, we use, a, again, like you said before, like you heard from the old time before, Finbert is a very strong sentiment score specific for the financial markets. And we've aggregated the scores uh, throughout the day uh, per asset and we're able to actually identify if this data is really relevant, you know, without even getting into uh, uh, the, the nuances of, of, of trading and portfolio construction and optimization, just at the high level, whether these data sets are actionable. <clears throat> so there's one uh, constraint that we had to overcome in the context of uh, BERT. And uh, it is a limitation of, of the technology that it basically it reads and analyzes 512K token. I mean, that's, that's the size of the token that BERT um, is, um, um, is analyzing. I'm sorry, 512 bytes token. So there's basically uh, um, a way for us to stitch multiple chunks together and look also at multiple modular portions, proportions of the article, whether it's the, the title alone whether it's a summary of the article alone or stitching out uh, the first, uh, or look at the first 512 token chunk of, of the beginning of the article, or again, stitching more uh, chunks together for the totality of all the articles together. Um, we have identified multiple approaches here. You can see on the screen here. First, we use the first 512 token. And then we partition the article into multiple pieces, each size of 512, and look at the average sentiment. And then we also looked at partitioning the article into multiple pieces and assigned sentiment total for each one 
uh, and then uh, use what we call uh, pl uh, plurality um, assessment. And of course, uh, there's other ways to compress the article into a summarized form and so on and so forth. So again, these are the things that we had to go through as, as data scientists to overcome these uh, techn technical, I guess, challenges of how do we best approach the extraction of sentiment from the Dow Jones Newswire content. Uh, we identified, by the way, that using um, the, the first uh, 512 of the title have been by themselves very predictive. And uh, maybe um, Otar and, and Brandon can talk a little bit more about that. So Otar, if you have anything to, to add here about what we found to work uh, with FinBert um, in the context of uh, sentiment, that would be very helpful here. Yeah, so it seems that the bulk of the polarity is actually captured by the initial paragraph of the bodies. Now, some articles are very long, and we know that we can actually process the sentiment of articles that could be thousands of words in length. But on a comparative basis, the first couple of paragraphs seem to capture the type of sentiment that is like the leading indicator of future performance, right? And that's what we discovered in this research, which was not, not our initial assumption because we actually tried to aggregate the sentiment cumulatively throughout the entire article. But the results showed that um, the 512 words that are processed chunk by chunk, that initial chunk pretty much has the best correlation to forward returns. Thank you. Thank you, very, very good. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Otar. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide because this is gonna give you the visual representation of what we actually found. And uh, essentially what you see here is two um, sections within the screens, two images. Uh, the first one on the left is the individual article sentiment distribution, basically looking at uh, individual article sentiment. And then, of course, looking at the aggregate uh, of daily sentiment for all the articles for a given asset, right? So you can see on the right side, on the right side, again, a similar distribution, but it's a more of a totality of the aggregate value as opposed to the individual article value uh, on the left side. Uh, the y-axis represents um, the frequency of the signals. In other words, how often do we get the polarized values you can see at the edges here with a strong, um, you know, color edges? The hue color, you can see uh, short sentiment in red and, uh, and green on the right side. And you can see that the majority of the articles on both sides really hover around the zero sentiment line. So the hypothesis that we had had actually is proven even visually very effective here that these edges is what we are actually going after, you know, finding short uh, potential um, opportunities with uh, negative sentiments at the edge, the tail end of those distributions, and of course, going with long on the tail end of the positive sentiment uh, distribution. Um, so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to share with you on that screen here. If Otar, if anything else you wanted to add here, please uh, chime in. No, I think your description is accurate. So most of the articles are actually neutral, but that is good because we are actually targeting the tails of the distribution. We want the articles that are the most polar, and we found that they're actually the ones that have the strongest correlation with um, price action in the future. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right, moving on. Um, so this is not a back test. This is basically what we call a back of the envelope, high level assessment of, of the, um, the, 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 what we call alpha decay. And I want to explain what alpha decay is. If you think about an article that has a very strong sensational kind of impact, versus an article that's pretty much a you know, regular uh, course of action news uh, article. Uh, each one has different type of uh, uh, length of uh, impact on, on the market in general. It is akin to if you uh, throw a rock into a pond and you have the ripple effect of a large impact versus a small impact. Uh, it's very much the same and we can measure what is the decay of that information, how actionable the information is when it kind of comes out, and of course, how long does it stay? Um, does it stay actually effective uh, in the context of price action of these positions that we're trying to target here? And it's really interesting. Uh, we were surprised actually because we thought articles have a very short 
um, length of, uh, of impact. But uh, we found out that those really extreme articles, the one that have those bigger impact, the most sensational one, actually have a much longer decay than we had thought originally. And we can see here that as you hold on to the positions longer over time, these critical news articles that are really a shift in sentiment for a given company stick around for quite some time. You can see that 80 days is what we found on average to have the excess return driven from that news sentiment carry forward. So that's actually an interesting finding because it allows us to uh, potentially hold on to positions longer and have a low turnover um, you know, uh, portfolios that can be, uh, you know, interesting for some audience. You know, obviously, as you can imagine, when the article first comes out, the first few seconds or first few minutes when it's published, it has the most impact. We're not measuring it here. Actually, um, Brandon is actually working on intraday signals from these type of articles that have immediate impact in the minutes as opposed to days. But this is really a different research that has the 80 days uh, kind of on average holding time in the context of alpha decay. Um, anything else that you wanted to add here, Brandon or Otar? Um, yeah, I would just add that after the 80-day holding period, the growth in return saturates, right? So it's advantageous to actually replace the old positions with new incoming signals. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Okay. So um, how do we optimize a portfolio using that, that information? And how do we actually go about building a portfolio that can actually trade algorithmically over time? So you can see that we identified uh, number one, long positions. Uh, we thought that um, positive sentiment has a uh, longer lasting impact uh, from what we see in this context than, than, short, sen than, than short sentiment. And we looked at the 0 0.75 uh, high or higher in the context of score. Again, one is the extreme. So anything from the, the you know, three quarters of the way to the positive end and, and higher. Uh, we looked at the 80 days uh, as initial holding time and we wanted to make it a little bit smarter, not to have a physical number of days of holding, but hold on to the positions dynamically as long as they continue to, to perform well. So we'll talk about that in a second, but again, you can see that um, the 80 days kind of almost um, um, manifests itself in the reality as well. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, also, how do you allocate between multiple uh, signals? You know, how do you give, uh, you know, one position uh, maybe higher allocation than others? There's many ways to optimize a portfolio. Uh, in this case, in our case, we went after a market cap. We looked at, uh, um, of course, uh, equally weighing the, the uh, uh, sentiment or the positions initially. And of course, as you have more articles coming in, you basically ratchet up the allocation up to a certain number, a certain value. I think it's 5% in our case here. So no position can be more than 5%, but obviously most positions, you know, we have about 150 or 100 plus positions in the portfolio, uh, the allocation per position is basically sub 1%. And of course, um, the whole idea is to make it dynamic. The whole adaptive notion of the portfolio is to drop the underperformers and make room for new incoming positions as they become relevant uh, from news articles that are coming new uh, to, the, to the market. So that's the idea. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the decile analysis, sentiment analysis, uh, and of course, uh, we have a whole variety of trade management to extend uh, currently held positions as signals get reconfirmed with new articles subsequent to the first entry. So all of that <laughs> comes into the equation when we build a portfolio. So just to summarize um, on the portfolio construction implementation, so basically the whole idea is to go after the Russell 1000. Why the Russell 1000? Because we thought these are the larger cap stocks to allow us to en enable a portfolio with higher higher um, size, right? Higher capacity. And uh, of course, uh, look for positions uh, every day, look for new positions at the aggregate that the score is uh, uh, 0 0.75 or higher. Uh, increase position size and weight as we get uh, additional confirmation for more articles in the future. And of course, uh, keep the uh, keep the allocation up to a maximum allocation. 
And of course, uh, call holdings with lowest sharp ratio to move out the underperformers and make uh, make some for make room for new ones. You can see on the bottom here about 150 positions that we found empirically with an average uh, uh, weight of 0 0.67. And we're trying to keep the maximum exposure at 1x, which is 100%. So use all your cash that's available to you uh, for these articles. And actually, it takes a little time for the, if you start from, from scratch, right? You start with a, a very few positions the first day, and then it starts to add up more and more positions uh, as the days uh, progress up to 100% of allocation. At that point, we don't take any new position until um, obviously there are other underperformers that make room for new positions. So this is um, a back test of our research. Um, just to describe kind of what you see on this back test, um, and I'm gonna go actually and show you the live, the live uh, back test on our platform. But uh, the orange line represents the benchmark, sorry, the, the, the strategy. So that's the Dow Jones uh, Newswire's sentiment strategy. The uh, blue line represents the uh, S&P 500. Uh, these results, by the way, are, are net of transaction cost, market impact, and performance fees. So all fees that we know of, including uh, transaction costs as well as uh, you know slippage, are all factored into these results. Uh, you can see, by the way, as you know, <laughs> this is a back test. So again, don't take that as uh, as empirical real money. We just deployed that strategy actually a few weeks ago, and it's still running. It's doing well, but. Uh, we don't have that length of history, at least with empirical uh, perpetual trading. Um, let me quickly uh, jump into uh, the actual um, strategy on our platform. This is kind of what our back test looks like. For those of you who are not familiar with our, with our technology, you can see here that we are 85% um, outperforming the benchmark for the same period. Uh, we're looking at a little slightly equal or slightly higher volatility but the sharp ratio is much, much better. Uh, annualized return for the last five years is 18.8%. Um, also, I wanna show you um, how I described before how the number of positions kind of grow over time until you get to 100% and then it stays that way all the way throughout. But again, this is not because we keep the same positions on forever and ever, we keep uh, changing those uh, by making new room for new performers and removing the underperformers perpetually as you go through this, uh, this, this uh, back test simulation. Uh, also, it's important to see how we measure capacity. Uh, this is a $450 million capacity before you start to really see degradation on performance. So you can have some, some punch to it as far as uh, allowing capital to, 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 to grow there. Uh, and the last thing I wanna show you here on the bottom is our uh, turnover analysis. Very, very low, uh, relatively uh, low turnover, um, 168, sub 100 in some of the years. Uh, so it's been really uh, nice to see that kind of performance with uh, relatively low turnover. Any questions about the back test, please uh, post them on the Q&A or the chat. Um, so I mentioned those uh, metrics before on the outperformance. Uh, we do see a win-loss ratio of 79.8%. These are transactions generated return. Again, this is not necessarily a big number or a good number because it depends on what the market was doing that during that time. As you know, the last 10 years before this, <laughs> this year began, you know, we, we actually had a pretty good, strong, bullish, uh, bullish market. But again, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, and the annualized return you can see is about 19% per year, which definitely beats the benchmark. All right, so what's next? Um, basically, our current strategy is end to end. Uh, it's end of day, right? So it's daily strategy using Finvert. I mentioned before that, um, you know, um, actually, Brandon, who's here working on something that's a little different, identifying maybe short term opportunities that are more narrow in scope about certain type of companies, certain type of industries or, or factors. And uh, maybe I'll let uh, Brandon quickly describe what he's doing with his current research on uh, ExxonNet. Sure, thank you, Ares. So we're currently looking into shorter term signals, as Ares mentioned, uh, long and short both, by utilizing ExxonNet to encode 
the sentiment of an article, but we also want to have, you know, what was the market context in which the article was published to give uh, a backdrop that might be a bit more informative of future returns of the asset in question. Um, and so we'll utilize things such as analyst consensus, um, the year over year revenue, earnings per share, um, balance sheets, you know, the momentum of the analyst consensus. Uh, we gather these fundamental features uh, and feed them into the model along with the text, which is a, a not, not a trivial thing to do. Um, but once we have all this information together, we then <laughs> have a much larger neural network uh, that processes all of that information uh, to give us the signal one way or the other. Um, and we do plan to extend this to uh, other sectors um, and time horizons. I know we are looking very uh, seriously at uh, oil right now. It's some crypto uh, is coming down the pike as well as other sector specific or even uh, asset specific. So these are things that we can very easily do with the Dow Jones Newswire data. It's tagged beautifully and it's categorized beautifully to allow us to do those things fairly, fairly easily. So, um, you know, we're very excited about where this thing is going. And we think there's definitely some um, unique opportunities here in different industries as we start going on, you know, into these unique uh, specific data sets. Um, I want to talk about uh, one other product that we have here. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm about finishing up here. There's two more slides here, um, which is basically the combination of multiple portfolios together. One of the capabilities of NeuroVest is to basically create a multi-strat uh, approach by which we combine multiple uncorrelated strategies together and create what we uh, kind of a, 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 a more of a um, combination um, outcome of, uh, of, of multiple uncorrelated signals that kind of uh, provide an ensemble voting of, of confidence in the signals. So if you have, for example, multiple data sets, each one chooses a stock, let's say Apple for that, for example, for different reasons, but they all chose Apple, that's a very strong conviction that we have something that can be sustainable. Uh, and we actually can do that. You can see in this picture, the whole idea of getting what we call a bottom-up approach. These are very unique thematic portfolios that are um, researched individually. We combine them together into a top-down approach that identifies how much weight to give for each one of those underlying legs and create a multi-strat approach. One of those um, capabilities have been, uh, have been created with uh, one of our new products called the Adaptive Trifecta which takes actually three sets of data sets, three data products, Dow Jones Newswire is one of them, and combining them together into a multi-strat long short approach. You can see here on that screen, uh, a backtest performance again, uh, this is historical, this is new, just, just launched uh, live. So, you know, again, these are all numbers that are being formulated as we speak, but we're really excited about it. You can see here, this is a long short opportunity that has three legs. Dow Jones Newswire is one of them. We have an ESG product as well as corporate earnings product as part of that uh, corpus of, uh, of long, long uh, signals. And they're being hedged with uh, ETF, highly liquid ETF that are being shorted. So it's a long short multi-strat approach. And you can see how it's manifested itself. It actually has a nice sharp ratio compared to the benchmark, which is again, S&P 500. Uh, looking at uh, much lower volatility, uh, much higher return even. And uh, you can see that um, uh, what you see on the screen here is basically four lines. The blue line represents the long leg only. The dark uh, line at the bottom is the hedge, which is the ETFs that we are hedging to provide protection during uh, market drawdown. You can see, by the way, by the way uh, in 2020, how the hedge kind of kicked in and really minimized the impact on the orange line, which is the actual strategy itself. And of course, um, the dark blue line that you see here is the actual benchmark. So we can see that both the long leg, which is more volatile, and the strategy itself have, been, have outperformed the benchmark. Um, and uh, this is exactly what you want. You wanna have a low volatility, a cruel return in a nice boring fashion throughout uh, it gives you peace of mind that you are protected and it gives you that little you know, uh, alpha generation. This is 1X, by the way, what you see on the screen here. 
Uh, this can be extended to be 2x, 3x, because you can see how the drawdown is so much smaller than the drawdown of the benchmark. It gives us uh, some flexibility in doubling or even tripling when we try and get really, really uh, you know, ambitious here on the annual return. So for 15, you can get to 30, even 40% annually if you uh, take more risk. Uh, anyway, I want to stop here and uh, make some room for Q&A. Uh, this is the time where I want to bring in uh, Taylor Core. Taylor is heading, actually, our entire R&D infrastructure. He is responsible for most of the things that you see here. Uh, and I'll let him maybe uh, chime in and maybe answer some questions and uh, filter through some of the Q&A sessions. Yeah, hey, this is Taylor. I've, I've, been, um, I've only seen one question on the Q&A so far. I'm answering a second one. Um, but I, I suppose actually, I'll, instead of typing this one, I'll, I'll answer it live. Um, the question is, are there events that you classify as leading or lagging towards the price? And if so, how do you treat them? That's a good point. Um, many articles uh, are commonly referencing past events. Um, as any news reporting agency goes, it, it, you sometimes have to reference events that have occurred. A common example of this is uh, earnings reports, right? This is something that publicly is probably available, and then an article will be written about it in the future. This, that information is actually still useful because um, if, if it's noteworthy enough to have an article written about it, then it, it, it is noteworthy enough to, to act upon. Now, the, the, the key point there is distinguishing between whether something is still relevant or not, because sometimes articles can be written days later about past earnings or, or um or, or any other sort of fundamental event, right? So um, the model itself uh, is purely distinguishing sentiment, but there are filters and allocation logics uh, that comes after that, which determines uh, whether the signal is still relevant. Um, Taylor, there's a bunch of questions in the chat room, actually. Somebody, uh, some folks have, have posted a bunch of uh, questions in the chat section. Uh, there's actually one very interesting one um, from um, Shoban. Uh, he said, how do you filter out fake news, which is a very pre prevalent nowadays, it is, <laughs> where it give you the wrong signal for the portfolio optimization. Um, so I'll, I'll address it. Maybe anybody else wants to join in and, and, uh, and answer as well. Um, you know, uh, the way we evaluate um, sentiment is the totality of all the articles given, to, given a subject matter. Um, most of the articles that we look at are, are financial in nature. Uh, there are obviously a lot of uh, misinformation in any part of the news, but the totality has proven to us empirically that uh, it overcomes some of the uh, nuances of uh, incorrect uh, information or, or maliciously just fake information. So, uh, so far, it hasn't really impacted us as much, but these are things that you need to be aware of. Uh, I'll tell you one other thing that's really in interesting for me as a, as a financial research professional you know, when you apply machine learning to other industries, let's say uh, healthcare, for example, uh, you are trying to um, solve a very fixed stationary problem for the most part. In the financial market, the problem is much more <laughs> complicated because you actually have to solve the problem that morphs in you all the time, right? The target kind of changes in you all the time, but also you have to address the filtering out of these fake news or fake information or basically data that's really not productive to your, to your needs. So it makes our job much more difficult. That's why 55% or 60% accuracy is, is really good for financial markets. But uh, in um, medical research, for example, you know, 99.9, .9, sometimes not enough to uh, approve a drug or approve a new, uh, a new uh, you know, treatment for a disease. So uh, things to, to remember there. I want to jump into, this is Eric, uh, uh, I run partnerships again. And um, that is a great question, and it, it emphasizes a really important point. Um, you know, with some media sources like social media or you know web scraped, you know pages or or or, or bulletin boards, whatever it may be, um, there are bots and there is fake news and a lot of it. In fact, I think that's one of the wrinkles um, in the in the current Twitter deal with um, with Elon Musk is the percentage of of, of fake news and bots, but. This particular data source, it's exactly the opposite. This is high quality, long form journalism by real journalists. So it, it by, by its very nature, um, is not fake news. It's, it's, uh, 
you know, they're, they're held, you know, they have an, have an editorial standard and, um, and uh, it's really high caliber stuff. And I know Martin has answered in the chat room along those very lines, but um, that's, you know, you know, something that's really important to highlight is, is the Dow Jones Newswires and its different, you know, properties, that corpus of data uh, is, is exactly not fake news. Yeah, um, Taylor, there are a few more questions here on the yeah, Q&A, um, if you want to take those. Yeah, a couple of questions around crypto. I'll, I'll address those first. Um, just to be clear, the, the, the research that you've seen today that we're making public um, is, is equity-based. So um, the equity universe is very large. I believe it's the Russell 1000 or 2000. Um, okay. Crypto, crypto uh, is an active area of research. So we don't have anything that we're ready to release public there yet. Um, you are correct about crypto obviously having less articles. But that's just by nature of the size of the market, right? Um, but uh, we believe that there's still enough content there to, to drive a strategy, um, especially given how uh, momentum driven uh, crypto is in general. Um, the other question was how do you handle missing values when doing time series analysis, um, specifically referencing weekends and holidays? Um, so when the market's not open, um, obviously you're not going to have any returns to, to base in your models. Um, that period between when a market closes, specifically talking about equities here, and when it, when it opens is typically called the gap period. Uh, you've heard of gap down, gap up. Um, those are important to take into account when you're building models. Um, in this case, obviously, our holding time spans multiple days. So we obviously need to account for those returns when we're building models for the intraday models that that uh, Brandon is working on currently, um, those generally don't like to hold over those timeframes because of the unpredictability, right? If, if, new if a news article comes out while the market is closed, uh, the actions you can take are rather limited, um, if at all, depending on what hour of the night they're released. So um, it all depends on your time horizon, I think is, is really the answer to that. Uh, the longer time horizons, you have to account for that long, shorter time horizons. You, you probably need to be out of the market. Um, reading through here. Uh, have you attempted to separate any price momentum exposure from the sentiment score either in signal construction or in performance attribution? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, that's a large part of, of what you saw there in the alpha decay chart. Anytime we're looking for a signal, you want to understand uh, how sentiment correlates to, to price action. Hopefully I'm understanding the question there correctly. I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but um, this becomes really important when you get to the, the shorter time horizons as well, um, especially when you need to understand how the alpha does decay uh, and, and when the optimal uh, time to exit that position is. Taylor, there's a question from uh, Himmet Kaplan. What kind of metrics and uh, do you use to measure your performance aside from cumulative returns? So we actually do quite a bit of, of, uh, of measuring <laughs> uh, as a data science team. You can see here, by the way, what we look for, volatility, sharp ratio, max drawdown, information ratio, tracking errors. These are things that we look at beta, and it goes even more than that. We have a whole bunch of uh, what we call rolling stats, value at risk, um, rolling uh, return attributions, uh, and it goes on and on, including uh, what we call trade analysis. So uh, it's quite uh, robust, and we do uh, quite a bit of that. And I mean, I'll add on to that. Um, it's, you know, when you're building a model, oftentimes you're, you're also looking at the model performance, not the allocation performance. Um, ideally, you're able to get those as, as uh, one and the same, but um, it, it, you know that that can be a hard problem depending on what type of signal you're working with. And when I talk about model performance, I'm talking about stats like accuracy and precision. Um, so if we're trying to predict articles that uh, are going to have a positive effect on on price action, uh, our positive labels are only those which have positive price action. Um, so um, in finance specifically, you want to uh, Reduce your false positives as much as possible. Um, having false negatives is, is not as big of a deal. Um, that's, you, know, you can think of those two as uh, taking a swing and missing versus not taking the swing and taking the ball or something like that. 
Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's my metaphor for baseball. <laughs> you only get one of those per, per webinar. Uh, uh, what kind of metric specific to your sentiment analysis model do you use to see that the model is providing merit for your investment? All comes back to alpha, those alpha decay charts. That's what we're paying attention to the most. Um, there, there is some nuance there. Um, some signals may produce a positive return, but the variance of that return across all of your signals is, is too great to act on. Um, it's rare that we see something that's unactionable, but um, you know, having high variance in, in that chart, you know, we're showing you the mean, but you don't see the standard deviation uh, in that chart specifically. It, when that's very large, it, it can be difficult to manage on the allocation side. Yeah, let me just add quickly, um, I, I think you already touched on that, Taylor, but, uh, you know, MCC score, we look at the um, um, AUC area on the curve, um, and of course, uh, confusion matrix, everything that goes into identifying the strength of the signal relative to um, getting lucky <laughs> and getting the same type of result because of the market conditions or the environment. So anyway, that's, uh, that's pretty uh, robust. We do a lot of these here. Uh, to identify and understand really where the data, what's the information coming from and what's the impact ultimately on price action. Um, okay, I think we have uh, just uh, exhausted our time. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Taylor, or, uh, or pretty much uh, we've answered all the questions that we have so far? No, uh, thanks everyone for listening to us and um... Hopefully we'll, we'll do another one soon with the uh, continued research. Yeah, thank you again for everyone, for the Dow Jones uh, Newswires folks, great partners, great data. And uh, thanks to everybody here at uh, NeuroVest uh, for participating and working hard every day to make, uh, make history. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day and uh, we'll see you soon.